And joining us now here in studio, Jonathan Rudin. He's Program Director at Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, and we welcome you to TVO, Jonathan. Thanks very much. I want to start by putting up some numbers which you know very well about the disproportionate presence of Aboriginal Canadians in our prisons and jails in this country. So if we can, let's bring these numbers up. While Aboriginal people accounted for, on average, about 3% of the Canadian population between the years 1997 and 2004, they made up 17% of victims and 23% of those accused of committing a homicide over the same time period. Between 1997 and 2000, the average homicide rate for Aboriginal people was almost seven times higher than that for non-Aboriginal people. In the years 0304, Aboriginal adults represented 21% of admissions to provincial, territorial, sentenced custody, and 18% of admissions to federal facilities. And in Saskatchewan, Aboriginal people made up 80% of those who were admitted to provincial sentence custody compared to their representation, which is 10% of the provincial adult population. All those numbers courtesy of StatsCan. Okay, many reasons why this is the case, and let's start to go through them. Uh, why are Aboriginal people so overrepresented in our penal system? Well, that's a very complicated and, and big question. Um, one reason, obviously, is that Aboriginal people have faced a series of discriminatory acts by the federal government. The federal government specifically decided uh, to eliminate Aboriginal people as a people. And so we, they set up things like residential schools and all those sorts of things. And there are impacts of those strategies that, that played out over the years. And one of the ways they play out is criminal behavior. You have people who don't have a sense of themselves, who, whose pain was never recognized and acknowledged, and it plays out. So these are programs of 100 years ago that are still being felt today. Well, they're 100 years ago, but the last residential school in Canada didn't close till the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't think that these things are only in the past. Mm -hmm. Aboriginal people face discrimination today. Still, uh, in, an Aboriginal person who lives in Northern Ontario and wants to go to high school has to leave their home and go thousands, sometimes hundreds or thousands of kilometers away to go to school. So this is not simply things that happened in the past. There are things that happen in the present uh, as well. I didn't mean to suggest they were happening in the past, but certainly the ramifications of past policies are still being felt today. No, that's very true. And, and we know that the impacts of, of events like residential school are passed on from generation to generation. Right. Uh, okay, I mean, that's clearly number one on the checklist. Uh, number two or three? Well, as, on top of that, Aboriginal people generally have less of what anyone wants and more of what people don't want. So in terms of education levels, in terms of income levels, Aboriginal people are near the bottom. In terms of uh, health, bad health outcomes, suicide, they're near the top. But those things trace back again to uh, some of those systemic issues. I mean, prior to contact with uh, Europeans, Aboriginal societies were very functional societies. It's not as though Aboriginal people didn't know how to manage their own societies and look after themselves. But these are largely the consequence of contact, and that's what we see now. In fact, 200 years ago right now, they were on the same side as us as we fought the Americans in the War of 1812. And if they weren't, the results of the War of 1812 might have been different. That's exactly right. Um, I, I, I presume that the disproportionate incarceration rate has only exacerbated all of what we've already talked about. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and the, and the overrepresentation rates really are an example, a glaring example of those issues. You run a criminal diversion program for Aboriginal offenders called the Community Council. What is that? The Community Council is a program that has members of the Aboriginal community as volunteers sit with other Aboriginal people who are accused of criminal offences and they talk about why the individuals have come into conflict with the law and work with the individuals to try and find ways that they can start a healing path. Because we find with the clients that we work with, while most of them have a history in the criminal justice system, they actually don't like it. They'd like to find a way out. They don't know where that way out is. Many of our clients are acting out the sort of scripts that people have predicted for them all their lives. So this is an opportunity for them to break out of that pattern and to talk to people who've experienced what they've experienced. So what are the guiding principles of Aboriginal transformative justice? Well, the guiding principles are, are respect. Respect is like the number one thing. You have to respect individuals for who they are. You have to respect victims for who they are. You have to treat them with kindness. You have to treat them with understanding. And if you do that, if you treat people with kindness, you treat people with respect, then they respond in positive ways. And they think, 
I don't have to lash out, maybe I do have a chance, maybe I should think about and talk about what I need to do to get myself better. So let's do, for instance, Abor unnamed Aboriginal youth, 19 years old, commits, let's say, a relatively petty offense, some kind of theft or something like that, or steals a car. Uh, okay, take us through. What does your program do? Well, what we do is different. There are, there are a number of Aboriginal justice programs across the country. For us, if we have a 19-year-old youth, they're likely someone who knows they're Aboriginal, but doesn't have much of a positive sense of that. They may not have any connection with their culture or with their community. They're acting out because maybe they dropped out of school. So when they come to the community council, it starts by sitting around a table, kind of like this, but a round table. Mm -hmm. People talk, start by introducing themselves, talking about themselves, talking a bit about their lives. And then the individual starts talking about themselves and the other council members talk about their life and their experiences. And through that process, the individual is encouraged to talk about not necessarily the offense, but what's behind the offense, what's concerning them, what bothers them, do they have an, an alcohol problem, the, whatever they have. And to talk about that so that the individual sort of thinks at the end of the process, you know, maybe I do have a problem, maybe who, I need to deal with it. Who runs the show? The volunteers run the show. There's the, not sort of one chief moderator who's in charge of... No, our, you know? program, our program is people sitting around in a circle talking. It can seem uh, bizarre, it can seem sort of anarchic. When I've sat in, I, because if I sit in, I'm sitting in as a staff, so I don't speak. The staff don't have a role. The, the expertise and the knowledge is in the community with the volunteers. So I sit around and I listen to people talk and I think, oh, I know, you should ask this question. But they don't. But you don't. You... They, and I don't, and they don't. They ask something else. And what they ask inevitably gets at the root of the problem. Okay, let's take it up a notch. Let's say, <coughs> excuse me, it's not just stealing a car. Let's say it's murder or manslaughter or sexual assault or something like that. Different process? Well, we're not likely going to get someone who's killed someone into our program. That's uh, in the courts and no questions That's asked. in the courts and it's, yeah. we're not going to get it. But often what you see is the root causes of these offending behaviors are the same. I mean, one of the things that we have in our criminal justice system is we put all our efforts into the people who commit what we perceive to be the most serious of the offenses. But really, often this reflects how people internalize their problems. Some people take their problems and hurt themselves. Well, the criminal justice system doesn't care about those people. Sometimes they steal things. Well, we don't care that much about the person. Sometimes they hurt someone and then we start to care. But if you deal with the person early enough and you're able to address the root causes of the behavior, then you, you can prevent some of that escalation. Okay, let's go back to the theft of a car situation since that's the one the council might handle. Is the victim at the table? The victim is invited to attend. Uh, in Toronto, where we're located, often the victims are not part of the Aboriginal community and often they don't want to attend. We, we might contact the victim, the victim might say, yeah, look, I don't have a whole lot of faith in the criminal justice system, you guys do it, but I can't be bothered to come. Now, we would rather the victim attend, it's better if the victim's there, but it's not essential. How often does that happen? We don't get a lot of victims showing up. Not a lot. No. But the ones who do show up, do they show an interest in the root causes of what might have precipitated the crime? They're interested in that, they're also interested in getting to know the person. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the things that helps when you're a victim of crime, when you see the person who perpetrates the crime, you realize that they're not necessarily the scary monster that you may have conceived of uh, in that moment. So it can be helpful for victims. Now we're putting this under the big blanket of Aboriginal Canadians, but of course that takes into account hundreds of different, you know, tribes, backgrounds, ethnicities, customs, languages, and so on. Does this one process um, take into account a lot of those differing things? Because most of the clients we work with don't come from particularly strong communities in the sense that they're not very plugged into their community. What our program does is it offers sort of an entryway into, for many of these people, into Aboriginal programs. It's true, we don't, you can't talk about a generic pan-Aboriginal approach to everything, but this is an entry point. So someone might say, you might say to the person, they might say, I'm Aboriginal. And you say, well, do you know, are you Ojibwe, are you Cree? And they may know that, they might not they know, know that. that. So we'll help them with that and we can tell them where they can go to find more about that. In other places, in British Columbia, there are programs in some communities in British Columbia or in Ontario where it's on the reserve and, and people know their clans and they know all those things, then that would proceed differently. But the individuals we work with tend to be fairly estranged 
from the Aboriginal community in a healthy sense. You prompted a good follow-up. Is this only on reserve or off reserve or both or what? In, yeah, our program is available to all Aboriginal people, so they can be a status Indian, a non-status Indian. Inuit, there's an Inuit population in uh, Toronto. They could be Métis. Any guess at how many people have gone through this? Oh, well, we've been running the program for 20-some years. We have, you know, a couple hundred, thousands of people have gone through the program. Th thousands of thousands offenders of people, thousands of offenders have, have gone, gone through, through the program. program. And, yeah. and uh, you know, what's the rate of recidivism like? Uh, recidivism is really hard to track, um, so we can't do that. But the federal government has done a number of studies of our programs, and what they have found is that our program and other Aboriginal justice programs actually reduce rates of recidivism. Our clients are among the most likely to commit crimes again. We work with the highest risk clients, and we have a statistically significant, and I don't do the statistics, so I don't know how they do it, mm -hmm. but we have a statistically significant impact on lowering recidivism. Okay, you ready for the politically incorrect question here? Of course Please. you are, you know it's coming. If you're a white kid who grew up in a tough neighborhood in an inner city somewhere in this province and you got busted for stealing a car, you know, your chances of going through the justice system or doing time or something like that are one thing, but my hunch is you don't get to enter a process like this. So for those who think that this is somehow special treatment, what do you say to that? Okay, there are a couple answers. The first is, in fact, non-Aboriginal people get better treatment in the justice system than Aboriginal people. So Aboriginal youth in Ontario are massively overrepresented in the criminal justice system at much higher rates than the rates that you were talking about earlier. Uh, the statistics that we look at show Aboriginal youth go to jail at greater proportions than non-Aboriginal youth for the same offenses. Aboriginal youth do not have access to the same alternatives to the justice system for youth that non-Aboriginal youth do. Is that so, judges are racist? No, it's because we already have a two-tier justice system. We don't like to talk about a two-tier justice system. We already have a two-tier justice system, and Aboriginal people are on the bottom tier. It's not about racism, necessarily, and usually it's not about racism, but it's about assumptions. We don't know much about this person. You're an Aboriginal person. You know, you probably don't have a father, you probably don't have this, you probably don't have that. I guess we have to treat you more harshly than we do non-Aboriginal people. Mm. There have been lots of studies that show that Aboriginal people in the justice system get much worse treatment than non-Aboriginal people. Probably not people. as good access to a good lawyer, too. They, their questions about quality of counsel is yeah. certainly an issue. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're saying in exchange for that, you know, we ought to cut them a bit of a break here. Is it's, that it? it's not about giving people breaks. It's about preventing crime, right? I mean, the point is Maybe not... cut them a break is a bad way. We should offer this other option. But, but, that's, but it's important because we do offer options. Uh, youth get all sorts of options in the youth criminal justice system. But what we want is an option that works. So what we know from the studies that have been done is that when Aboriginal people get a chance to go into an Aboriginal controlled program, there actually is a better chance that that, that will address the root causes of their behavior. And if you do that, what you end up with is someone who's not committing crime. And that means you have safer communities. So you're not treating people better, you're creating a safer community, which is the outcome we want for everyone. That's, uh, that's partly right. The other part of this is, if you're a politician who's trying to sound tough on crime, this may not meet with your agenda. So you say it's a better way to do things, but for a politician who gets his chops being tough on crime, it may not look like a better way. Do you know what I'm saying? There's no question that if people are concerned with appearing to be tough on crime, then anything that is not jail uh, seems to be soft. It, that approach loses effectiveness, that's saying we're going to, we would rather appear to be doing something than actually do something, but that's a political reality. Now fortunately, our programs, the ones that we operate, the, the Community Council program, is funded both by the provincial and federal government, and we're, we're grateful for that funding, that's important, but the, the overall climate these days is not one that's incredibly hospitable politically to these sorts of programs. So are you expecting to get cut back? The federal program was just renewed for a year, 
So we know that we're funded for a year. Same funding? Same funding. Um, and everyone is now already worried about what will happen next March because we, A, don't know if the program will be renewed and B, at what level. So that uncertainty is there, but we've lived with that uncertainty for the 20 years that we've run the program. Gotcha. Jonathan Rudin, Program Director, Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. It's good of you to come into TVO today and explain this to us. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.